Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'll uh, kick off uh, today's session. My name is John Pridnia. I'll be your host and moderator uh, for the panel today. Uh, welcome to our most recent installment in Raymond's Empowered Planning Series. Today's topic is your business transition. Uh, just so you know, housekeeping items, a link to the slide deck has been posted in the Q&A. I'm sorry, in the chat section. And uh, as always, please feel free to post any questions that you may have during the presentation in the Q&A tab found at the bottom of your screen. You know, business succession and transactions were already a very complex area, both with internal and external influences. Internal, like if I should sell, when should I sell, why should I sell, family involvement, management participation, outside investors, and external like market conditions, cap rates, interest rates, taxes. Um, but you know, over the past couple of years, issues brought about by COVID and changes in Washington have pushed complexity into an entirely new level. Additionally, having no certainty to the 20, 2022 and future income and estate tax details with extensive discussion of these looming changes that could potentially impact a business transaction um, has not only added to the complexity, but it's compounded the sense of urgency and significantly increased the amount of activity in this area, as I'm sure our panel of speakers will attest to here today. In our webinar today, we're gonna to be talking to you about some of these pressing matters. How to determine when? Once you make that decision, what are the next steps you should be taking? What are the considerations that need to be addressed to maximize value? Uh, determine the impact, the tax side, all of those items that are so important in making the decision. Today's speakers are Ryan Sullivan, who will lead off helping us through the issues of should you sell? When should you sell? And what do you need to start thinking about in order to prepare for that decision? Joe Asher will follow Ryan with putting some clarity into the value of your business and key motivators to those transactions. And then Eric Shoemaker will conclude with tax impacts and the importance of proper planning, proper structuring to ensure optimal after tax results. So to get things kind of kicked off, we're gonna start with a quick polling question so that our panel of experts and maybe myself as well can get a feel for any particular areas that we might wanna focus on today. So if you'll answer that question and we'll get started right away. Looks like a lot of not sure yet, so that's that's interesting, and and um, I think that's what we're start what we're seeing here internally with some of our customers and people asking is I don't know what it means, I don't know what the first step is, so where do we go? So that reinforces what we're seeing with the increased at least interest and in activity in business transition. So again, remember to post any questions in the Q and A throughout the presentation. Reach out anytime. We'll try to respond either as we go along or uh, at the end with available time. Now I'd like to start off with Ryan Sullivan, who's gonna lead us off with the essential questions to ask yourself when contemplating a business transition. Ryan? Thanks, John. And, and yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we're, it's, the environment right now is unique. And uh, in this space, as it relates to business owners and the decisions they're having to make, it's, uh, it's definitely unique as far as how um, the activities coming to them. So how to make good decisions. And, and our goal really today, and from my perspective as a financial planner, is helping you with some of the emotional aspects of this. So thought provoking questions um, and providing some examples of what other business owners have done and, and, and some of the hurdles they've encountered and then how to be best prepared. Uh, so John, feel free to chime in once we get some of the uh, polling results. Um, next, we have our second poll here. And this is again, another, if we've already identified that uh, we're not quite sure when we'd like to transition. The next question is, who would you like to ideally transition your business to? We've got family, management, an integrated buyer, investor, or venture capital, or other. I haven't yet really decided. You know, Ryan, as they're starting to come in, there's a lot of those haven't decided, and um, family is, is a close second. So a lot of succession, family succession issues possibly mm -hmm. in play, as opposed to outside sources, but a lot of undecided. Undecided is uh, probably at least a third, uh, if not more. So, 
Well, excellent. And I think that's that's what we typically see, right? Is is a lot of family-owned businesses. They ideally would like to look internally first within the family, multi-generational businesses, um, and, and and vetting out that potential um, or haven't decided yet, which is alive and well um, as we see some businesses that aren't aren't necessarily looking within the family and might want to look externally. So, um, as we move down this path, what we find for for many for many households when when they start to think about should I transition the business? Should we transition the business? One of the areas that we find that is, isn't focused on enough is you've spent all this time to get to this point within your family or yourself individually. Um, what are you going to do with the time, literally the time you have on your hands post-transition? What's your life going to look like? And, and that's an area where we, we've seen the output of that for folks who haven't, haven't focused on this enough that all of a sudden the dust settles and they, you know, they haven't thought through this. What are you going to do tomorrow when, when you're not running the business anymore? You don't have that responsibility. You don't have all that demand because clearly you're, you're in a position where you're, you're not working a nine to five gig, here, right? It's not a 40 hour work week. It's, it's 24, seven, 365 for decades. Have you thought through what are you going to do with your time? Again, it's a, it's a really exciting thing to consider, first of all, but, but doing it before you're in the middle of a trans, transaction. Um, when you're in the transaction, it's easy to focus on just getting a deal done um, or maxim maximizing the economics. But what are you going to do after the transition? How are you going to spend your time? We've seen plenty of folks um, focus on themselves, focus on hobbies they haven't really, they've neglected over the years, right? We all have those. Or pick up new hobbies, travel. You might have family that you'd like to spend time with uh, and, and, and see more often than you do now. Um, and for many of you entrepreneurs out there, it's just the next opportunity, the next deal. Right. So you're looking at what's the next business I want to run. Do I want to be an active investor or a passive investor in another business? Um, that entrepreneurial itch may not go away. Um, so think through that. What what are you going to do with your time post transaction, post transition? Um, if you don't have to go into the office, you don't have to go into your, your factory, your facility tomorrow and you're not getting those calls any longer. What are you going to do with your time? And then, of course, being prepared. And, th and this is an area where, uh, you know, John alluded to this, but um, we were seeing this pre-COVID as well. It's just the, the volume of, of dollars in the marketplace, the volume of transition with the baby boomers um, aging and a really entrepreneurial next generation coming up. Um, what we have found is that most business owners don't, um, can't anticipate truly the date when they're going to be ready to sell or transition their business. Um, it's usually a scenario where you just wake up one day and you're ready to not do this. You don't have that same passion, that same drive to be the one that's responsible for that entire workforce, to be the one that's driving innovation, to, for, to be the one that's driving accountability and, and, and bottom line success. Um, it's difficult to forecast when you're going to feel that way. The other scenario is um, the scenario where, you know, you get these calls all the time for, for folks who may want to purchase or merge with your firm. Um, but rarely do you take them. And all of a sudden, one day you take the call. And all of a sudden, that number is, is one where you're like, huh, I, don't wanna, I can't say no to that. And then you're, and then you're in. And then you're in the, the conversation. The big question is, have you prepared yourself personally um, from a financial standpoint? Have you prepared the business um, to, to, to maximize your value, to maximize your life's work? Or are you, are you going to find yourself in a reactive mode where the deal is too attractive to walk away from, but you haven't necessarily prepared yourself or prepared the organization to do what's best for you and, and all remaining stakeholders, clients, associates, employees, um, other investors, other owners. Uh, so a, a couple of great examples, great areas to focus on. Um, one would be, think about your team. So before there's an offer on the table, before you have... Um, you know, before you wake up, you know, one day and say, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be done. Do you have a team of, of trusted advisors there to help you make great decisions, right? You know, and when you think through that team, you know, many of us have financial professionals that you work with, legal professionals you work with, but are they your trusted advisor? And I think a great test for that is when you have difficult, uh, complex decisions to make, who do you call? And if you find that there's a, a handful of folks that, that, you know, that's in your Rolodex that you don't call when it's time to make a decision, they're probably not the right team member for you. But when you start thinking of who would be on that team, think of those folks that are technically sound, that know 
all, all the rules, the regulations, they know, you know, the tax code, they know estate planning, um, cash flow, debt management, investments, and that's all important. Um, but really focusing on those people that know you, they know your organization, they know your family, and you know, really most importantly, they, they know your values. Um, and, and think of that as a team, ideally a team that you can develop years in advance of a transaction or transition, and one that you can carry with you post-transaction and post-transition. Again, that core team of advisors. Once you have that team, then you can start digging into what are those ideal outcomes? Th that team can help you position both the business and yourself personally um, to be in a position for flexibility and options when, again, when you do wake up and you're ready to be done or when you have that offer that, that comes in unsolicited um, or when you say, look, we're ready to take this thing out to bid. Um, having that team together, helping identify what are those ideal outcomes. And again, that's going to be different for everybody. It may not be maximize the dollar amount, but what's the structure of that deal? How is the income going to work? What's going to happen to the employees? What's going to happen to management? And, and again, that's one of those scenarios where there's so many options and so many different circumstances starting to identify that years in advance. What are those ideal outcomes we have found per, put you in a position so when the deal is there, when the time is right, you're, you're much more able to take advantage and leverage that to maximize uh, for all stakeholders. Uh, and again, then develop your plan. So again, this, this, this sticks to both the personal and professional side is build out your plan, build out your model and revisit it with your team on a regular basis so that, again, when these uncertain times come up and you're ready to go or the deal is right, um, you, have, you have the ability to model it out, compare it to your plan, and then execute it and leverage the opportunity. Because again, for most of you, this, you're only gonna have one shot at this and to do it right is, is critical. So again, be prepared, have your team ready and develop a plan and revisit that plan on a regular basis. A quick example, and, and we, we see more and more of these all the time, but this one really stuck out to me as we were preparing for today. Um, a great example of uh, a family-owned business. The you know, same family's been running the business for a number of decades. Um, I, about five years ago, they, were, um, they weren't necessarily shopping their business, but they just got that call. They took the call and, and the number was right. The circumstance was right where they, they decided to engage on an offer. Um, they went down all the way down that process hadn't necessarily prepared proactively, um, almost got to the close. The deal didn't close because there were way too many questions and, and it didn't close. At the mo in the moment, it felt like a big disappointment that they didn't take advantage of this opportunity. Um, the upside was, as part of that process, they were forced to think about a lot of things we've talked about already today. Who are your team members? Um, what are your goals? What are your values? And then over the next handful of years, they put together their team, they built their um, outcome and value set, and then they developed these personal and professional plans. Um, and then here over the last year, they had another opportunity and they were prepared, they were able to maximize the opportunity and they were able to almost double um, the, the, the net proceeds um, because they were prepared, because they had a clear vision of what was important to them. But again, two great, one client, one circumstance, two great experiences. One was a learning experience. And then the next one, they were able to capitalize on being prepared for that moment that they weren't anticipating exactly when it would occur. So again, keep in mind that, you know, not all deals are the only deal that'll come along, but again, being prepared can help. And, and again, the key takeaways I'd say at, at a really high level from a planning standpoint, be as proactive as you can. So no matter where you are in the, in the stage of transition, um, think ahead. Think about not just the moment, but think about years from now. What do you want um, out of this opportunity? Develop your team. Think through who, who are those people that you trust, that know you, know your family, know your organization, and again, most importantly, know your values. And again, be proactive. So the more proactive you can be, the more flexibility and options you're going to find for yourself and your family and, uh, and your organization. Well, Ryan, that's uh, that's all great things uh, to be considering when evaluating whether to sell and and getting what what you, I would refer to as mentally ready for the transition, right? And yep. that may be the most difficult hurdle to get over in many of the situations that we often see is getting mentally ready, whether it's ready after after you sell or getting ready to sell. All the other factors that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to call them next steps, but sometimes those steps have to come before the mental part, understanding what your business is worth, which Joe Ash is going to talk about now. 
um, once you get through the if and the when, you really need to understand how much. You need to understand what's my business business worth. So, Joe, can you help us come, go through some of those areas that you want to consider and what's involved in that process? Sure. Thanks, John. Um, well, I'm Joe Asher. I, I'm a senior manager at Raymond in our valuation group. And when it comes to succession planning, we've seen a significant uptick in valuation work related to that. Um, as John indicated earlier, due to COVID primarily. Um, but what I'm talking about today with this first slide here, the right next steps once you decide to transition. So, you know, there's a lot of disciplines um, and topics involved when it comes to succession planning. Um, this is gonna be kind of a high level overview of, um, you know, what's involved in terms of valuation and um, what's your motivation. I believe the second session of this uh, webinar will go more in depth on the details and more of the technical aspects of valuation when it, uh, valuation topics when it's related to succession planning. Moving on here. So uh, question for the audience here. Um, what is most important to you in a transition? And I'll talk about this slide as you're answering that. Um, obviously, extracting maximum value is important to some people. Um, most people, I would say, most business owners, but it's not necessarily the most important thing for, for many business owners. Um, protecting employees, for example, if you have a, a longtime manager or a longtime a uh, group of employees that you've, you know, you've discussed selling the business to down the road, you want to make sure that that transition goes smoothly. Um, there's also the, uh, what needs to be thought about is how is that employee, or how is that group of employees going to be able to pay for the pay for the business, you know, are they going to be able to come up with, say $5 million um, to buy a business or whatever that whatever that dollar amount may be. Um, those things need to be thought about. And, and if that's your your, your most important, um, what's most important to you in a transition, you know, maybe you need to think about um, changing that employee's um, compensation plan or start using their compensation plan as part of paying down uh, the purchase price of the business, which is expected five years from now. Um, making sure that that transition goes smoothly. Do you wanna have a seller note? Things of that nature. Obviously legacy is another one where, you know, people who have been in, in a business that's been handed down from generation to generation, they want to make sure that that business, the name carries on, the reputation carries on. So that that's an important thing for some people. Uh, generational transfer, you know, obviously a lot of people want to transfer uh, ownership of their businesses to their children or their grandchildren. Or maybe, you know, you don't know at this point, you haven't decided what you want to do and, and, and that's fine. Yeah, Joe, you can see which... Uh... I think is no surprise that the more I work with business owners, they have such a passion for their people that, you know, we're seeing that as being the leading edge and, and you know, extracting, uh, getting maximum value, of course, is very important, as you said, close second, but protecting employees, um, not so surprising is the number one answer. Yep. Okay, so what is your transition timeline? Um, how long you have until a transition event can significantly impact what you can do and in what fashion. So, I, you know, there's four different time frames on the slide here, but I like to think about it, um, kind of what Ryan was saying earlier. There might be situations where you get an offer and you only have six months to, to kind of uh, plan for a sale. Um, obviously, that's, that's less ideal than if you can plan uh, five years in advance and there's different things that can be done. You know, for example, if you have uh, less than a year to try and market your business or present the value of your business. Um, one of the main things that we would do is, is, is look at the historical results, historical financial results of a business. And we'll try and do like a financial diagnostic test, I guess you could call it, where we'll go and look at um, historical tax returns or financials, especially for, for smaller privately held businesses. And we'll try and normalize those results to present the business in its best light and maximize value. And what we would do with things like that is we'll go through and um, remove any personal expenses that you might be running through your business, um, adjust officers comp, you know, owners comp to a fair market level of compensation, adjust um, 
rent building rent if you own your building and you know you're paying a rent that's not necessarily at a market rate things of that nature what you're trying to do is present things on a normalized basis that buyers or potential buyers or whoever would be transitioning into ownership would want to see um, what what the business would look like on a normalized basis going forward now if you have more than more than that if you have three five years three or five years would be even better you know you can you can actually start to think about those things in advance and you can start presenting financials that are actually where you're paying yourself a fair market comp. You can start to prepare your management team to take over your role and pay them a higher comp or tra transfer your client relationships to them as opposed to having all of that, you know, as, as the business owner, it, it's better to be able to transfer that risk, that key man risk is what they call it. Because when someone, uh, buys a business and they're looking to buy a business or transition into a business, they see that, you know, the owner of a business, if he goes away, am I going to lose all of these clients? Cause all of these clients want to deal with him specifically. So the more you can transfer those relationships over. And if you have five years to do that, you can transfer it to your management team. What you're doing is you're lowering risk and you're increasing cash flow. So these are all things, you know, you can divert. If you have time, you can diversify your client base. You can figure out if you're, you're paying your employees too much, uh, improve margins. And you can actually present results on a normalized basis as opposed to presenting adjusted results when you only have a year. Um, Post-transition involvement, this is uh, an important consideration um, for any business owner. You know, determining your level of involvement with the company after the transition is key. If you choose to stay involved, you, you should consider the following. Um, you know, a lot of times people or business owners they've been doing this their whole lives and they don't want to let it go or they want to stay on and help help the new man, new owners transition um, smoothly. Um, so as a business owner, when you're selling a business or transitioning, you need to think about how long you want to stay involved and in what capacity. Do you want to stay on as a consultant? Do you want to stay on full time? Um, is it you know, if this is a family member coming on, do you, you know, and, and these, these considerations in terms of what your compensation would be um, and what your role would be, these, all, these would all factor into negotiating a deal as well, because, you know, maybe, maybe the deal is structured where you're getting some kind of compensation and therefore you can adjust the purchase price of the business in that situation. But it's definitely something that is considered in a transaction um, and, and is important when it comes to, to evaluation in, in, in that situation. Um, do you know what your business is worth and do you, or do you know, or do you think, you know, so <clears throat> being in valuation, we see a lot of smaller privately held business owners that don't necessarily understand what drives value and what their business is worth, which is normal. You know, they specialize in, 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 in their industry and they don't necessarily understand, um, what drives value in a business. And a lot of times what we'll hear is, well, you know, so-and-so in, in, in over at this business in the same industry as mine, and they do exactly the same thing as me, they, they just sold their business for 10 times EBITDA. A lot of times what, what business owners don't realize is that, yeah, maybe that, that business did get a high multiple, um, but that business might be very different than yours and you just might not know it. You know, they might have way higher margins than what industry averages are. Um, they might have a more diversified client base or, or, or perhaps their profit margins are higher than industry norms, whatever it may, may be. There are many reasons why certain businesses that you hear these multiples for multiples of sales or multiples of EBITDA, what these businesses, businesses, businesses are selling for, they might not translate to your business. And so what we do is, is we'll give you if, you, if you have time to plan five years or more, whatever it may be, even within a year, you, you still you still need to have a real, realistic understanding of what the value of your business is. And that's what we do. And sometimes when we, when we give people a realistic value and we actually perform a valuation of their business, sometimes they're surprised. You know, sometimes they think value is less and they're planning on selling to employees at a, at a very discounted rate. And they may not realize that it, if they actually took it to the market, it could be worth a lot more. Uh, who is in the driver's seat? So, the answers to the questions previously mentioned impact who or what is ultimately making these important decisions. You know, obviously, if, if a business is primarily, if it's, it's purely financially motivated, 
the people involved in that should be kind of what Ryan was saying, you know, your wealth managers, your, your investment bankers, your CPAs, your, your valuation consultants, and obviously the owners, you're trying to maximize value. Um, when you're, you know, say, say your, your primary consideration is legacy driven, generational or employee promises, not that, not that financially, not that value is, is not important, but you need to have conversations with those people as well. You can't just, you know, you, you need to be discussing how that, that role of that, that family member is going to be able to take over their business or how these employees are going to be able to take over your business and what needs to be done to make sure that transition happens smoothly and, and how they're going to come up with the money to actually purchase the business. Will, will the owner of the business work with them on a, um, you know, with a seller's note over time? How, how will it be paid for? Lastly, um, everything discussed previously drives decisions that need to be made along the way. We tend to think of it as a decision tree that has many nodes. You know, I, I think really as a business owner, you need to look yourself in the mirror. And if you can do it sooner than, than later, like Ryan said before, that doesn't always happen. But if you can plan five years in advance, you need to think, what is your ultimate goal here? Do you want to do you want to sell to a family member? Do you want to gift to a family member? Do you want to um, maximize value? And once you figure out what that goal is, then you can start thinking, what pre-work do I need to do in order to get to that point? You know, what needs to be done to my financials? How do I need to change operations? And I think the, the summary here is that with succession planning or the transition of a business, you, you really just the sooner you start planning for it, the better, the sooner, the smoother things go and the, and the more you can maximize value. Thanks, Joe. You know, value is uh, such an important and leading factor in the decision for um, making a business transition. I mean, after all, it's the owner's life and work and long-term efforts that went into building this and um, ultimately, that is the measure, right? That's the measure of their life's work. So it is, it is a key issue. And I think, you know, for me and, and the businesses that I work on in their transition, the key takeaway is that, you know, even if you're not in the I'm going to sell mode, uh, the preparation, the understanding, the data you collect, the recon that you can collect, understanding what it's worth, what are the drivers to either enhance or detract from value? And then being able to work on those as you go through. It's, you know, so many times people look at it and just say, oh, it's just a multiple of EBITDA. Yeah. Not always, you know, there are other factors that come into play and key employees and all these other very important things that build into value. So great topic. Thanks for providing that insight. And, um, now talk about a driver. We're going to pass it over to Eric, who's going to talk about the net side of the transaction when it relates to tax and tax issues and the constantly changing environment. I'll let you take it over, Eric. Yeah, thanks, John. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Eric Shoemaker. I'm with our tax and advisory department here at Raymond. I lead our private equity uh, industry group and also sit on our M&A merger acquisition uh, practices leadership team. So spend a lot of time in the space, really helping our clients understand uh, structural and tax, tax aspects of the transactions or transitions that they're going through. But we're gonna start off here real quick with a polling question for everyone to, to think about. Uh, you know, the question, do you feel like you have a good understanding of the after-tax value of your business? Uh, you dream about it every night, you, you know what it is, or hey, no, I have no clue and it gives me nightmares. Uh, somewhat, you know, I, I think I know what I, the number is. It's not what my valuation is worth, but it's something different or hey, <laughs> what is after tax? I'd say most of, we find most of our clients are somewhere in that somewhat uh, C category. And I think John is the polling kind of closes out. I'm sure you'll, uh, we'll probably find you're, that. That's, you're almost, you're almost at 90% on the people that are somewhat <laughs> understanding. So I guess, I guess that kind of points to your, uh, your conclusion as well. Yeah, no. So it's not uncommon as we get into conversations with clients or, or opportunities that, that we come across to say, Hey, you know, what, what is our after-tax value of the business? So obviously Joe and his team are going to give you what that marketable value is, but we, we know on our end of the world, it, it's something different than that, that we get the, 
walk away from the transaction and do uh, you know what we want to like Ryan was talking after the the business is no longer in our possession or you know our baby anymore what do we do from that point forward and this is how we kind of help uh, you know work in tandem with that group to, to understand that so moving on here you know it's show me the money but after tax that is right so we all we all need to to baseline set and we work with our clients to help really understand what is that after tax cash that we could we can walk away from the transaction uh, with at closing or you know on that transition and how does that play out and the sooner as you, a common theme here you heard Joe talk about it Ryan talk about it the sooner we're talking about this the sooner we're looking at it the more time there is to plan, to make changes, to do things structurally, if needed, uh, to put ourselves into a better, you know, after tax cash position. And I will say, and, and I'm sure John can attest to this, uh, you know, through everything we're seeing in the, the either the M&A space or the family succession space, it, there's typically some structural things that have to, uh, to happen. Um, and knowing what those tax ramifications and the benefits of doing some of those things uh, are very important. So, you know, there's a lot of planning techniques out there that, that we work with our clients on as they're going through any type of transition, whether that be family succession, you know, there's some trust structures that are out there depending on the organization structure that can help defer or avoid any tax to, you know, the patriarch who's handing it off and, and taking some chips off the table. So understanding those motivations and what we can do, yeah, that can be very powerful. You know, management buyout, I, it, there's a, a lot of different uh, ways that that can take place. A very popular one that I'm, I'm seeing a lot more in the space that, uh, than I have probably in the last decade is you know, employee stock option plans and buyouts. And, and how do you structure that to be efficient for the exiting owners? How do you structure that to be efficient for the incoming uh, employee trust. And, and what does that mean again? You know, hey, what's the valuation difference that that might have back to Joe's comment? And then the big one that we're seeing right now, third party sales. You know, there's a lot of, you'll hear the term dry powder in the market. A lot of private equity groups have a lot of invested capital as we've been in a pretty strong economic position here. And so they're, they're out paying good multiples, good values for businesses. Um, and again, they, they are looking to implement a strategy with the money they're investing, which often, you know, requires some, some different changes in uh, the structure of the business or how we go about it. And again, there's strategies that we can help implement and we, we look at as we're trying to maximize that after tax cash flow. You know, one thing that's, that's very interesting and in, in that we'd like to take a lot of advantage of if we have the right circumstances is the real estate aspects of a transaction. Um, you know, a financial buyer may not be as uh, intentful and in, in really wanting that as part of the deal, but willing to make, uh, make it work. And, you know, there's a lot of options out there for deferral in those types of scenarios when we're talking about the real estate. So as we talked about this, I referenced structure over and over, and it's very common in today's world that we uh, we go through this period where you have your business structure as you've always done it, whether that's tax, legal, uh, accounting. And typically post-closing, post-transition, we're left with something a little bit different. It might operate and, and be taxed the same way, but it is different. And there was a transition that took place. And really in helping you know, the, the clients that we work with, the folks who are in this transition understand why we're doing what we're doing brings a lot of value to them, whether it's, you know, after tax cash flow planning or it's just peace of mind. And yeah, that's one thing that we focus on a lot. That's why when, you know, Ryan was talking about building out that team, we actually find ourselves in our, our uh, transaction services group, our M&A group, working with a lot of other CPAs who, you know, to their credit are working with clients who are selling their life's work not something they deal with on a daily basis and so they they will reach out know that we have that practice capability and we just become part of that team we're not there to replace them we're there to work with them help provide that insight and that experience and and that's another value driver that, that we help bring to those transactions uh, you know corporate versus partnership versus LLC and what does that mean uh, how are they taxed 
you know, asset versus equity, all common questions and things that we're looking at and looking at, hey, what does after tax cash flow look like under all of those scenarios? Uh, deferral opportunities, what might exist as we are operated today that we can take advantage of in the transaction, whether that be rolling over some of our, uh, our value into this new business structure, whether it be some of these other uh, you know, tax deferral strategies that exist out there. But at the beginning of all of this, I think where we find most of our clients are lacking in that knowledge is that very first question that we pulled on. What is the current after-tax value of your business? And one of the first things we do in any engagement as we're working with that seller or that transitioning uh, owner is really wrapping a frame around that picture. So we're, we're not going to be dead on right on that first blush, but we're going to wrap our arms around it and help give some insight so that as we go through that transition or through that planning, everyone's armed with some real data that we can fall back on. And, you know, John and I have an experience I'll share right now with a client who's in the midst of a uh, transaction right now. And it was, uh, it was really getting bogged down between buyer and seller as to what the dollars needed to be and where they needed to be placed in the purchase agreement. You know, what, what was the effect of that and the after-tax cash flow? This was, uh, uh, you know, kind of a family transition, internal sale. And, you know, it was getting to the point where the two family members were about ready to just walk away from the transaction. And they were struggling, you know, different advisors on both sides. And ultimately what helped that move forward was us sitting down with both sides and really helping everyone come to a common conclusion of what, what the, the sale looked like with the values that were agreed upon. And helping provide that clarity to the, the seller as to what the after-tax cash flow looked like from their standpoint and helping the buyer understand the benefits or tax structuring to them uh, post-close. And ultimately what that did is allowed us to avoid a lot of contentious family interactions, but also to move forward. Once everybody agreed to, you know, what we were looking at were the numbers and the data, it was hard to argue that things were somewhere in the, the gray area in between. And that transaction is now moving towards closing. But it was really that nobody had spent the time up front to really understand the true numbers and what it really meant. And we were getting hung up on negotiation and confrontational items that really had no, didn't need to come up or did not have any impact on the ultimate after-tax cash flow anyways. So I share that with everyone here on the, the conversation today that it's a priceless investment in the early stages of when you're thinking about transitioning a business, really understanding what the tax ramifications may be. So when you're going through those discussions, when you're going through that transaction, you're not making mountains out of molehills or neglecting an, an item through the negotiation that could have significant tax impacts. It's just helping provide that clarity. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, you know, I think I think of that example very clearly in our discussion today because it's a perfect example of you determine what value is the 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 mental side of getting over selling the business. The transition was all done, but the the parties really couldn't quite understand the structure side, right? What the structure did and the modeling that you did was provide an example of a win-win. It worked for both sides if you structured it the right way. And so the key, the key takeaway was it was positive, positive. It wasn't a fact of walking away because we couldn't quite get a reach on the numbers. We reached them by doing the right structure. So a great example. I'm, I've got a few questions coming in, but I want to toss something back to you, Eric, really quickly. So maybe talk a little bit. I don't want to get into too much technical issues, but value of getting the quality of earnings a study pulled together as part of the understanding of what your business may or may not be worth. And then also maybe a little touch on the uncertainty that taxes maybe in 22 or sometime in the future, <laughs> what is that doing to it right now? Yeah, no, good questions, John. So on your first question there, quality of earnings. Uh, so for the folks on the, the call or on this webinar who aren't familiar with that, it's uh so typically in, in historical trends, you would have had buy side due diligence. So obviously buyers going to come in and kick the tires on your financial picture and along with other things. 
But part of that is this quality of earnings kind of report where they're gonna look at and do, as Joe kind of mentioned, do some add backs, do some subtractions. Are you paying yourself too much, not enough? To really try to normalize and say, what should the, what has the historical financials looked like uh, you know, in the past? And if we were to normalize them for the way we might operate the business, because that's gonna really drive our value. A, a modern trend here probably in the last five years that's really upticked, and I think the reason it has is because it provides a lot of value, is actually what we refer to as sell-side due diligence or sell-side quality of earnings. So you as the seller preparing to go to market again, getting your ducks in a row, having someone like Raymond or uh, you know one of your advisors do this work up front to say, hey, let's sit down and talk about some of these things that we're going to expect any buyer is going to push back on or want to have a conversation around. And again, to Joe's comment, you know, are there things that we should look to change if we've got enough time to change them? Are there uh, the ability to, to paint the picture the way we want it to be painted versus somebody coming back on the back end and interpreting it the way that they want to, because it's, it paints a better picture for them. It gives you the ability to be full disclosure up front, understand where those areas of adjustment might be, and frame the context around them on your terms versus a buyer's terms. So very common, uh, you know, a lot of advisors recommend that uh, anybody going to market do that kind of work up front for those reasons. And then John, you hit it, uh, you know, you're alluding right to what's on everybody's mind right now. What do taxes look like? We're in one of those unique time periods in, you know, political and, and tax history where it's hard for me to paint a picture for clients what taxes are going to look like in two months to six months, let alone three years down the road uh, with the current administration and some of the pending changes that could be out there. You know, there's a lot of discussions that we're going through and in, in helping bring that clarity to transactions and to sellers as to what after tax cash flow looks like. It really gets into that next phase, John, right? The planning of, hey, what deferral mechanisms or how do we how do we really minimize taxes? And right now we're in a, hey, there's a lot of different options depending on which ways go, the, the things fall here before the end of the year, um, but we don't have that clarity, which is always great, right? And tax planning, not being able to have clarity as to what the tax code might exist um, like at, at the end of the year. So, you know, there a lot of strategies around installment sale. Do we accelerate gains this year because we know what capital gain rates are as we sit here today? Um, that could change going forward. Are ordinary rates going to be higher or lower depending on the structure and which kind of business type you're in? Those are all conversations that we're having. And, and unfortunately, we don't have that clarity at the current moment, but you know, continuing to work with clients as, as things comes out is, is our mode of, mode of the day. Yeah, and it's, it's difficult and we say it often, it's really hard to find the direction when you don't have a map, when there, when there is no, there's no roads, there's no guidance. Um, and so we, we all are struggling with what is it going to look like? And I, I think that the understanding and why we're so active and in, in a lot of activity going on right now in the M&A world is we know what we have now. We don't know what we're going to have next year or the year after the year after. And so if you have an opportunity and you've done your homework and you're ready to do it, the feeling that the necessity is that the timing, you got to get things done sooner than later is, is certainly there. I'm going to go to a couple of the questions that have been popped in, and I'm going to, this is really uh, maybe Joe and Ryan, um, and it's a great question. Um, is there ever a time if gifting to a family member, for example, you would want the value of the business to be as low as possible? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that happens quite often. Um you know, when, when you're valuing a business on a fair market value basis and for, for, gift, for gift tax purposes, one, one strategy to, you know, minimize value would be, I, I guess one of the main differences between a, when you're gifting shares is you want to really consider gifting a non-controlling interest in the business. So, you know, as, as you're, as if, if you're gifting, you know, sequential gifts over the years, um, it, it would be a, a tax benefit to gift non-controlling interest because the IRS does allow for discounts for lack of marketability. I, I think there was another question related to that. Discounts for lack of marketability and lack of control um, for non-controlling interest. And the discount for lack of marketability, you know, can be anywhere from 20 to 25% for a non-controlling interest, meaning less than a 50% ownership interest. 
Um, and it, you know, that, that discount is a smaller discount if you're, if you're valuing or gifting a uh, greater than 50% interest. Um, there's also, you know, when you're valuing a non-controlling interest and you're gifting a non-controlling interest, the theory behind, behind value, why a, a non-controlling interest, let's say you're gifting 10% this year to your son and 10% next year to your son, instead of, um, or, and then 30% the year after that to get you up to 50%, doing that over three years, instead of doing a 50 or 60% gift all at once, allows you to value it at a lower value for each gift. So a non-controlling owner or a non-controlling interest in a business doesn't have the ability to, to make certain business de decisions. You cannot, a, a non-controlling owner cannot dictate what the owner decides to pay himself. They can't dictate um, what the controlling owner decides to, to charge as rent for his business. And so when you're projecting cash flows of your business, which is how we value a business typically, we will project higher expenses because we make the assumption that the owner is going to continue to pay himself this higher comp. He's going to continue to pay a higher than market rent within reason, as long as it's not, you know, uh, ridiculous, I guess. Um, but those are ways that allow you to pay less taxes, obviously, um, when you're, when you're gifting to family members. Yeah, and so, I it's think more, that's, so it's uh, along the strategy line, I would say that when, if, you're, if you're thinking about an internal, a family transition, the thought process, and maybe this is in Ryan's uh, side of the equation, is the thought process is significantly different than an outside sale. And, and I don't want to say you are going in with the intention of out manipulating a low value or manipulating a high right. value, but you want to do what you can to drive the value up or down based on your flowchart or your, your decision tree. Right, Ryan? Exactly, John. I think, Joe, you make great points. And I, to me, I think it goes back to the original, you know, one of the original questions, the polling questions of, of, although it's important to know, that, you know, kind of the market value of your business, but I really think it's important maybe at the front end to know ideally who you'd like it to transition to. So if we're talking about a family transition, you know, you happen to be in an environment right now where you might find it hospitable to transition and gift shares to family members now while we have a very a relatively high lifetime exemption for gifting compared to what it might be, you know, a year from now, you know, at an absolute, I'd say within four years, you know, we're going to see some, some different um, numbers there. So yeah, again, who do you want to transition it to? And then I think you, that's where it's a combination of both thinking about estate taxes, income taxes, valuation, and then probably a, a, a therapist or a family counselor in, in the room too um, is important. It all goes together, doesn't it? I think it's right. there's not one one single decision making um, flowchart that we can look at. It's all of the above when it comes to uh, making that decision. Yeah, Eric, and, I think and, you might have been commenting something. I I, I might have cut you off. Was that you, Eric? Yeah, I was just going to say this whole uh, you know idea of gifting and in valuation is again a very hot topic, as Ryan alluded. We've got some significant potential changes um, from the Biden administration on taxability of wealth transfer among generations. So another piece of that transition puzzle of, you know, family dynamics and transition inside of the family, uh, very hot topic outside of just the private equity markets and external transitions as well. Yeah, exactly. Joe, I'm going to pass it back to you. I know you had one comment, but I'd also like you to comment. There was one question about what are specific considerations that go into valuing a business? I know you touched on some of that, but um, if you can maybe provide a little bit more light in that area. Sure. Um, you know, when, when valuing a business, you're really trying to determine what the, what the risks and likelihood um, are of achieving future cash flows. So, you know, the two, the two primary considerations are the level of risk associated with the business and the level of cash flow. And, you know, when, when we determine value, we look at what the company has done historically. And like I said before, we'll make historical adjustments to normalize out non-recurring items, one-time large expenses that, you know, maybe the company moved lo office locations and, there's one-time moving costs, um, adjusting officers comp to a fair market level. You know, like I said before, there's a big difference between valuing a non-controlling interest and a controlling interest in a business. And not that, not, you know, what I said before is not, it's not that 
value is being manipulated. There is true difference in value between a, someone who is buying a 100% or a majority interest in a business versus someone who's buying a 10% value or interest in a business. It's just simply worth less. Someone who has 10% doesn't have the ability to make certain decisions that someone who has control of a business does. And those, all of those adjustments, such as officer's comp, you know, should it be adjusted or not, depending on control or not, should, should rent the, the rent that you're currently charging, does that need to be adjusted based on uh, the level, the subject interest in the business that you're valuing? Um, you got to consider things, like I said before, key man risk. If a company has, you know, I was just valuing a, a, a manufacturing company, an auto supplier, and the owner of the business all of the relationships were really through him. There was nothing, um, there, there was no written contracts. They made, you know, significant revenue, significant profits. But the reason why um, there was such high risk that had to be a- applied to those future cash flows that we were projecting for the business um, is because if he leaves, there's significant risk that a lot of those clients will not want to work with a new owner of that business. So, there, there's a lot more that goes into it, um, but those are kind of the high level things that we think about. Got it. And you know, that that illustrates clearly, there's no formula, right? There's no yeah. specific, this is what you include in box A and box B, right? It's, right? it's a lot of understanding the business, understanding, I'll say the net book value, the cash flow, normalizing, additions and subtractions, all of those things that go into what is my business worth? It's, it is not just putting, filling in the blank, so to speak. Right. Correct. And, and, you know, we also look at things like market transactions of, of similar businesses that have happened in the recent past. We'll look at, like I said, those market multiples that are indicated by industry participants that have sold in the recent past, but we'll also look at the intrinsic value of the company where we'll project out cash flows that are expected. And we call that an income approach. And then we discount those cash flows at a present value factor to value what the business is worth in today's dollars. And that, that present value factor factors in those risks that I mentioned before. And as I started out saying early on, one of the external conditions and, and, and drivers is cap rates, right? So can you comment very briefly on kind of what's happened with cap rates over the past maybe decade? Yeah, you know, and, and it really, I, I'd say cap rates have gone up, which, you know, obviously the, the higher the cap rate, the, the, the higher the risk and, and um, the lower the value. But, um, you know, cap rates have trended up and it really depends on your industry. Um, it, it, it really varies over the board. You're getting um, higher multiples and cap rates associated with more technical types of businesses. Uh, manufacturing has remained relatively steady, um, but it, it really depends on, on the industry that you're valuing. Got it. So industry related. And, and I would also say that, you know, the components of the sale, including real estate, not including real estate, all of those things are factors that come into play, whether it's long-term lease agreements or selling the building or whatever it is, there's, uh, that's one of those, of those other measures that you've got to evaluate when you figure out what, what's, the, what's the bottom line and uh, what's the key takeaway. Anything else from the panelists? You know, I, the- I jotted down a note here um, from the very first poll. So we had 33% of the participants in this uh, webinar respond that they were looking at exiting or transitioning a business in less than two years. So that's a pretty significant. That's a third of the participants today and probably pretty general across the, you know, the general middle market uh, that we see in our client base and, and where we work. And so the key there, getting back to a common theme is if that is your timeline um, and you haven't begun this process, I encourage you to immediately start to talk about it, think about it, engage your team of advisors who will help you through that. Again, um, the more time you have to think about it to address items through that process, the better off you will be and the easier it will be for you through it. Uh, Transition, transaction, sale, gifting, any of that has a lot of emotional stress that goes along with it. But the more prepared you are going into those um, situations, the less that stress has to be. And surrounding yourself with the right team of advisors to be your key sounding board, you know, advice givers, you know, receivers, that's going to be key for you. And I just jotted that down initially, wanted to bring it back up that there's a good 
a good uh, percentage of our participants today that are in that window where that's really important time to start thinking about this. Thanks, Eric. I couldn't have said it better. That's uh, that's a great way to a great note to wrap it up on. Get prepared. Get surrounded by your right team. Um, thank you, Joe, Ryan, Eric, for your insight and the opportunity for our listeners to hear more about uh, what you do and, and how it impacts that business transition and business succession. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. We uh, look forward to bringing you part two. Uh, it will be in September. I believe it's going to be on the 24th. That's our tentative date. But keep an eye on your email um, and uh, we'll send out those invites just as soon as we lock everything in. With that, everyone have a wonderful day and let us know if you have any further questions, send us an email. Take care.